Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the next presentation, part of the, the Craft, Brewer, Craft Brewers Professionals Conference. Excuse me. My name is Alex Coral, uh, and I am Regulatory General Counsel for Sovo Ship Compliant, and I am very happy here to be here talking to you all about uh, beer label regulations and registrations. Uh, first off, I just want to thank everybody for joining me again today. I, I've been a participant at the last few of these conferences. They're always amazing, great content. So it's just such a privilege to be here. So again, a big thank you to the Craft uh, Brewers, uh, uh, Craft Brewers Professionals Guild um, for, for inviting me back and, and for you to uh, listening for me today. Uh, I'm here to talk about label regulations, beer labels, how to register them, what to know about how to manage them, and to follow the rules. And, and I think that this is really a valuable and interesting topic, a necessary topic in a lot of ways, because it can seem a little bit, you know, staid and boring. It's, it's what matters is what's in the bottle, what's in the can, not necessarily what's on the outside. But if you really follow that kind of mindset, there are a lot of minefields. There's a lot of traps you can fall into. And if you then fail to understand these regulations, fail to understand the rules, fail to follow them, then you can be trapped. And it kind of doesn't matter how good your beer is because you won't really be able to sell it. You'll get into those, those, uh, those pitfalls. Uh, and so I, I'm just delighted to be able to, to talk to you about these, to kind of uh, explain some of these rules, explain what we're talking about. Um, and so let, let's get into it because there frankly is a lot to the regulation of beer labeling and beer branding. Uh, first off, just a little quick about me, uh, about who I work with. As I said, I, I'm regulatory general counsel with Sovo Ship Compliant, and we are a le the leading provider of software compliance support for the beverage alcohol industry, managing all sorts of interstate shipping and distribution compliance. Uh, we have a full suite of cloud-based software solutions. Uh, we've been active for over 15 years in this industry, providing a lot of, of support for the direct-to-consumer shipping industry, but also for three-tier interstate distributions. And that involves a lot of label rules, label regulations, label registrations. Uh, so we offer those full suite of state-by-state of -state label registration requirements, integration with the TTB to manage your COLA and other label rules there, a full suite of, of reporting and licensing support as well. Uh, and, and we also actually operate and said provide to the various states the product registration online service that some of you may have already used to register your labels across different states. Uh, so we have a broad variety of, of, of support that we can are happy to provide to the industry. If you want to know more about how we can help you, I, I suggest you go to our website, sovos.com slash ship compliance, where you can find a lot of free publicly available information on shipping and distribution of beer, uh, and then just find out more about how we can provide you with specific uh, services to, to manage your, your interstate distributions. But we're not really here to talk about ship compliant. We're here to talk about the regulation of beer labels. And these really do operate on, on two different levels. Uh, as with so many things in the alcohol industry, you need to manage both federal and state-by-state -state rules. And so that's kind of how we're going to break things up today. Is first, I'll talk a lot about the different federal regulations, and then we'll get into the different state rules uh, and, and state labeling. Uh, I'm going to try to reserve some time at the end for questions as well, so, so feel free to uh, submit those. Uh, if you do have something that maybe comes up a little bit more in the moment, you can feel free to interrupt me. But I think more broadly, I'll try to reserve uh, bigger questions for the end. Um, so let's get into what are the federal regulations of beer labels. Um, and, and so we really start with the federal rules because that is where we see a lot of the more broad, universally applicable rules. Uh, the rules of one, what can and cannot be on your label, all those sort of things. And these do really apply on a, a broad scale. So first off, what are we talking about when we talk about beer labels? And, and why do they get regulated? Why do these rules exist? Um, well, you know, I think very, very clearly, the, the label is there to identify your product. It's there to identify uh, what's in the bottle, what's in the can, what your consumer will be expecting when they make that purchase. And this is a great way to market yourself, to explain yourself, to be identif easily identifiable to consumers. Uh, you know, consumer is walking down an aisle. They see hundreds of different beers in the, the coolers. How do they recognize yours at a glance and know that's the one I want? Uh, 
it's having this very distinguished uh, particular label, this identity uh, that they can they can recognize and know that they're getting quality, know that they're getting the beer that they want. But because that is a, a way to communicate with consumers, because there is that interaction, this also makes it a very scary uh, area for the regulators, for the lawmakers, uh, because there is this thought that they might be, um, they're, 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 this is a way, uh, they want to make sure that you are communicating with your consumers in a clear and honest way and informing them about what they will consume and then not misleading them in any way. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these rules were developed in the 30s, coming out of prohibition, so you may, you may not be as... as um, expecting people to be dishonest these days, but these rules are still in place. They are still effective. And so you need to be following them and recognizing what is under regulation at which different moment, uh, the different rules in the different states or the different jurisdictions you're operating in. Um, and again, just be abiding by all of those required and prohibited information, what needs to be on your label, what cannot be. Um, and, and so you're providing that clear, honest and direct communication with your consumers. Uh, and again, it's really important to recognize these rules to begin with, because as you might have a great campaign, you might have a great designer making uh, incredible labels that you want to get out there. But if they're going to be violating these rules, then you can't actually get them in, in market. And that sort of defeats the purpose. So again, it's good to have a, con a, a very clear understanding of what these rules are to begin with to avoid those later on problems. Uh, so first off, where do these rules come from? And at the federal level, they're found in two different statutory locations. Uh, first, you have in the Internal Revenue Code, uh, 26 U.S.C. 51. Uh, this is, you know, where, where you get a lot of licensing rules. This is where you get taxation rules on uh, alcohol. And there are also rules on what can and cannot be on labels. Uh, there are also rules similarly in the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, the 27 USC. Um, and there are different rules for different product types as well. So beer, wine, spirits, they all have different rules about what can and cannot be on their labels. Generally, they're usually they're the same, but there are some nuances. For instance, uh, ABV claims, uh, alcohol content claims can be different between the different products. So it's important to recognize what you're selling and how that is uh, defined under these different statutes and how therefore it may be regulated. Um, and, and note that there are different regulations, different requirements under the IRC and the FAAA. Uh, and there are similarly different definitions of beer and malt beverages under those different those different statutes as well. Um, so for starting off with the IRC, this is a little bit more of the broader overall comprehensive uh, statutes of when it comes to labeling. Um, and, and how this applies to beer products is that the IRC defines uh, or, or, or will regulate what they call, what they define beer, quote unquote. Uh, they define beer to be, the statute defines beer to be any beverage brewed from malt or malt substitutes with an ABV greater than 0.5%. And so that really is very comprehensive. It includes a lot of different products uh, that, that you might be brewing and might, might be baking made from whatever malt products you're using, including any neutral grain sugars or anything like that. This is different from the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, which instead uh, uh, regulates what it calls malt beverage. However, it defines malt beverages as beverages brewed from malts and hops. So therefore, to be regulated under the FAAA as a malt beverage, uh, your product must be made from malts and hops, whereas under the IRC, hops is not a, a requirement. Uh, and, and so this really gets important then when if you are making those sort of, you know, very, very chic, uh, trendy products, uh, seltzers and such that might be made from malt sugars, but do not include hops, they would be regulated under the IRC, but would not be regulated under the FAAA. And in fact, there are not any different other product types that they would fall under under the Federal Alcohol Administration Act. Uh, they would not be considered a spirit. They would not be considered a wine. Therefore, it's kind of a, a blank when it comes to the FAAA. They may as well not exist. So again, this is really important there is recognizing what specifically you're making and then which rules will apply. Uh, note that both the IRC and the FAAA include rules on what mandatory and prohibited label information. Uh, so regardless of what you're making, you would still need to have, and we'll, we'll talk more about these, 
but those uh, government warnings, brand information, uh, contents of fill, those are our requirements under both uh, 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 acts. And so you would need to comply with both of them. The real uh, uh, difference between the IRC and the FAAA is the COLA requirements. Again, I'll talk a lot more about what COLAs are, but just know that if you are you know, making a, a beer under the IRC, but not a malt beverage under the FAAA, you would avoid those COLA requirements. Uh, and, and, and so um, that could be a, a big uh, benefit if you are, again, making those a malt beverage that does not include hops. Uh, anything with hops, though, still we need those requirements. And again, we'll get into those more. But again, it's just all about recognizing which rules for each product uh, because th they can be different. And, and this is really a good uh, uh, thing to keep in mind for basically any jurisdiction you're dealing with. Uh, we'll talk more about state by state regulations as well. But you want to recognize that maybe Texas has a different definition of your product than Florida does or New York or Illinois. Uh, so recognizing the statutes, getting those definitions is, is always a good uh, uh, rule of thumb, a good place to start uh, when you're understanding what regulations apply. Um, I've talked a lot about, we've, we've mentioned a lot, the, the mandatory information. These are sort of the, the requirements under federal rules on how you are supposed to identify the contents and the, uh, the source of your product. Um, again, a lot of the fear originally uh, around the federal government that that led to these rules was was the idea that before prohibition, there were a lot of, of shadier suppliers producing who knows what, just trying to get out there. And so as we were coming out of prohibition, they developed these rules on what needs to be on labels in order to identify it, in order to make sure that it is safe and, and consumers are aware of what they're getting. Um, all of these rules are applied under both the IRC and the FAAA. Um, so essentially, regardless of whatever you're making, uh, these rules will apply. These mandatory information must appear on your labels. Uh, there are five broad categories or those six broad categories of, of required information. There's the brand name. This is the identification of what the product is marketed under. Um, here's a, a dirty secret of alcohol regulation is nobody really defines what brand means as it said as a definition in statutes. Uh, it's often defined as the name that the product is marketed under, under how it is identified to uh, consumers. But whether that is the brand is, you know, coral conglomerated beer productions, or if it's Alex's uh, Colorado beer production, or if it's the best brown ale around, it, it, it's really amorphous. Nobody has a clear definition of what is a brand. If it is that more overarching uh, company name, if it's more of the, the brewer name, or if it's even the individual product, it kind of comes down to how the, the uh, brewer, the individual seller might market it in the moment. But do note that whatever you do consider your brand name needs to be clearly identified, clearly marked on the label so that consumers know who's producing this, where it's coming from, what this is. Um, related to that, you need to have the producer, importer, name and address. So where it is manufactured, where it's coming from, that information must match what is on your late, your, your, your uh, TDB brewer's notice, that uh, license information must match uh, what is on the label. Uh, you need to identify what the class and type is. This is very often just beer or malt beverage. Uh, make sure that it does meet those definitions of, of how the TTB understands those um, class and types. Uh, if you are going to be more specific and identify it as a Pilsner or a, a Brown Ale, again, make sure that you are using those specific uh, class types as identified by the TTB and that they are, are true and honest to what is in the, the container. Uh, net contents is another very important uh, required information. Uh, you need to indicate what size, how much a consumer will be drinking at a time, and it needs to be in a very specific format. Uh, for beer, malt beverage products, it needs to be, it needs to use imperial units. Uh, so ounces, pints, those sort of information. Um, and it, you need to use specific uh, uh, versions of that. You can't say this is an 18 ounce bottle. It needs to be one pint and two ounces. Uh, and, and if you're not doing that right, again, this is a reason that the TTB might have uh, um, you know, reason to inquire what you're doing and, and, and might issue some notices. Uh, alcoholic content is another uh, critical part. Note that for beer and malt products, it is not required at the federal level to include alcoholic content. Uh, you do not need to say how alcoholic your beer is. 
But if you do, you need to use, again, very specific formatting. You need to uh, you know, follow the, the TTB's recommendations, uh, make sure you're, you're, you're abbreviating, abbreviating everything properly, you're using slashes, you're using the percentage signs, uh, a lot of very specific information. And so you might have a great idea about, you know, I'm going to make this interesting, I'm going to make this a little bit cuter. Just kind of avoid those, those sort of things because this is, um, there are specific rules about how this is supposed to look. Uh, and, and this gets to a very important one, the government warning, that big splashy warning says, don't drink if you're pregnant, don't operate machinery if you're, you're drinking. Uh, and, the, you know, it's a very specific statement that is set out by federal law. It's in the statutes. It's in the regulations. It needs to have these specific words in a specific order. Again, very, very specific formatting that needs to be followed with the government warning, just as with net contents and alcoholic content. Um, so, you know, again, don't get cute with it. Just follow the rules so that you, uh, you can make sure your, uh, your labels are, are going to get approved, are going to be following the rules. And again, you know, make sure you are, are getting it at that right pica content that you are, are pica size, you are getting your call that, that, the, all the punctuation and formatting, because if it's even slightly off, that is again, reason for the TTB to, um, send you some some questions in the mail and that might not be very uh, uh, comfortable to deal with. Uh, so again, just make sure you are understanding this proper formatting, make sure you're understanding where this information needs to appear, that it is clear, and then you can kind of uh, do a lot more with it, make your labels more interesting, make them eye-catching. Uh, this does get to, however, you can't do everything with your labels because there is a lot of prohibited content. Uh, again, this gives back to the idea of uh, you know, shadiers, suppliers, pre-prohibition, saying things they shouldn't. Uh, the federal government is very key on making sure that you will have honest and and uh, clear uh, uh, labels. So you cannot have any false or untrue statements. So nothing that creates a uh, misleading apprehension in the consumer, nothing that, that uh, um, makes it seem like your product is uh, uh, what it is not, essentially. You, you, know, you can't say that uh, it's it's... It has certain qualities that it doesn't. It has certain taste profiles that it doesn't. Uh, it has to be honest to what the consumer should expect. A big thing is you cannot have any disparaging remarks or in images. So you can't basically demean a competitor on there. Uh, there are rules that apply similarly within advertising as it can't really uh, downplay your competitors. Um, and, and some brewers have gotten in trouble with that in, in, in recent years. So again, you want to be careful with that, making sure that your um, your labels are honest and are, are, are friendly. A big one is geographic terms. You cannot use any terms on your label that would create a false impression of the origin of your product. Uh, and, and so I think everybody knows that you can't say it's champagne unless it's actually made in champagne. This is very common in beer industry. There are a lot of rules about you know, geographic terms. So for instance, you can't say this is a Belgian golden ale. You guys can only say it's a Belgian style golden ale. You cannot create that false impression that it might be actually from Belgium um, or that, you know, it's a, a Czech Pilsner. It's a Czech style Pilsner. Um, there are a few exceptions to this within very common understood uh, uh, product types. So India Pale Ale is fine. Russian Imperial Stout is fine. Uh, but again, those other geographic designations uh, you need to make sure you say style and not create that false impression that it was produced where it was not. Um, and, and so very be, be, be key on that. Be aware of that. Uh, other prohibited information, again, government iconography. Uh, so there are, are, you can't have any sort of statements or stamps that would create the impression that has been approved by the federal government, by the state government, any other governmental body. Um, there are some beers that I've seen that kind of uh, skirt that, you know, I think officially you shouldn't be able to use the American flag, but I've definitely seen that on some very high profile beer cans out there. So um, these might be stretched, but again, you can't have that big stamp that says, you know, government approved, which was, was a thing that happened pre prohibition is especially around whiskey. It was, you know, government approved whiskey, but it was kind of rot gut in the bottle. So this is where uh, these rules come from to make sure you're not misleading anybody. Uh, similarly, health claims is a is a big thing, is a big no-no, uh, at least when it comes to untrue statements. Uh, so anything about, you know, improves digestion, makes you sleep better, do not put those on your labels unless basically you have 
the entire scientific and health community behind you supporting that. If you have clear and copious scientific evidence, maybe you can support a health claim, but otherwise it's, it's kind of a fraught area. And similarly, no false endorsements. Uh, so if you are, are working with a, a celebrity, you want to use that sort of, of, of impression, make sure, again, you have approval, you have this clear uh, uh, relationship with anybody. Um, so otherwise, you're not creating this false impression that uh, um, there is an endorsement of this product that may not actually exist. Um, and I talked a lot about, you know, specific formatting, all these different rules, all these different nuances about what can and cannot be on there, where it needs to be on a label, how it needs to look. Uh, you might be asking, this is a lot of information. I don't know. How do I keep this all in mind? Where do I go? Well, thankfully, there's actually a lot of clear information. The TTB has been really good about trying to make this clear, trying to make this more obvious for uh, suppliers, producers, labelers out there about how these should work. So if you are a little bit more uh, legally minded or just sort of that, that have time on your hand, you can go through federal regulations. Uh, these are written out in the, the 27 CFR. Uh, again, different rules for beer, wine, and spirits. So recognize what type of products you're making and, and what rules would apply. Uh, but if you are a little bit more, more short on time or if you're just uh, not so uh, minded to uh, pour through legal regulations, uh, the TTB has produced these beverage alcohol manuals or BAMs uh, for each product type that go through point, point, point on all the required and prohibited information. And all of that required information, they go through a lot of examples and specifics on formatting. So again, if you're wondering, you know, do I say 8% alk by ball? Where does the slash go? Where do they put the periods? Where do I abbreviate things? All that information are in these BAMs. Again, there are different ones for the different product types. And these are, are just really invaluable. They're, they're freely available on the TTB's website. And if you are, whether you're using an outside designer or an in-house in designer, I, I highly recommend just always keeping these on the desk right next to you so you, you can know what, what's, what you're required for. And again, get ahead of these required information, get ahead of these formatting issues. Um, so you don't get caught down the road. You know, you might have a fantastic design, this, this incredible label that's going to catch everybody's eye. But if you're hiding the government warning in a little corner or if you're um, misconstruing the, alcohol, the, 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 the net contents of your product in a way that the TTB doesn't like, that's going to ruin all your plans. So, again, it's good to get ahead of this. Know what the rules are so that you, you know, don't get caught with your pants down. You, you're, you're aware of this and you can move forward and and apply these rules to your label design right from the get-go. Um, and, and again, there's a lot of information on the TTB. Uh, you can actually reach out to them for some, some uh, um, pre-approval information. Uh, and, and so just be aware of these and, and be active, be proactive about uh, understanding these rules. Um, because then when you actually get to the approval process, you can make sure that it's a smooth one. And speaking of which, uh, we'll talk now about that approval, the, the COLA process at the federal level. So what is a COLA? That's a certificate of label approval. Uh, and these are basically approvals by the TTB of all labels being sold in interstate commerce. Uh, the TTB requires uh, most alcoholic products to have gotten pre-approval on their labels before they can be sold. Uh, and, and this is, you know, before you can even go to your distributor, you might need to have a cola in hand. Um, this is a, a, a uh, approval by the TTB. This is notification that your label uh, meets all the requirements. It does not have any prohibited information. It has all the required information. Um, and it, 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 it then gives you the right to sell your product. Note, however, that there are not, this does not apply to all products. Uh, the, as I said earlier, the COLA process, the certificate of label approval process is, uh, mandated is, is set out under the federal alcohol administration act, but not the IRC. Therefore, if you are making a product that is not subject to the federal alcohol administration act, it is not subject to COLA regulations and is, 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 it's entirely excluded from it. So if you are making one of those natural uh, uh, hard seltzers from malted sugars, but no hops, um, colas are just not available to you. If you try to submit a cola, the TTB would say, I'm, I'm sorry, this is 
um, not available to you. They will reject it. They will send it back to say, you know, just ignore this process then. Uh, there are also some limitations on malt beverages, uh, uh, notably under the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, malt beverages as defined as controlled by that act. So beer or malt beverages with hops, they are only subject to the COLA process if they are being sold in interstate commerce. Uh, that is the only time federally when you would be required to get a COLA. If you are making a malt beverage that is only going to be sold in your home state, uh, again, you do not need a cola. It's perfect. It's 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 fine to get a cola. It's it's a, uh, available to you. It might be a good idea just so you get this uh, notification of approval. You make sure your labels are all in compliance. Um, there are some states that even if you're only selling it in state, may require you to still get a cola. That could let you get ahead of your future plans to to establish distribution in other states. Um, so again, you're, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine to go and get a cola, even if it's not required by federal law. But if you are selling a beer only in your home state, um, know that this process is, is not required of you, and that can really save you a lot of time and a lot of headache. Um, so again, this is just understanding what products are, are re regulated by which different rules um, and, and avoiding any unnecessary uh, work where you can. What does a cola process look like? Well, this is why it's not necessarily a bad idea to get it even if you don't require it because colas are free. There's no charge to getting a, a cola and it's it's actually not that bad of a process. The TB has done a tremendous amount of work over the last decade to make the cola process much easier. Uh, I, I'd say the first thing when you're looking to get a cola is to review your BAM, go back over everything, make sure you have the, the mandatory information, make sure it all looks right, make sure it's all formatted in the proper way. Once you have that all set, you go to the cola's online system. This is something that is uh, you know, set up when you get your TTB license, so you should have access to colas online. Uh, the TTB is in the process of integrating that with their uh, licensing services as well, so that should make it easier. Uh, there are other services that you can use for, for submitting colas as well. So if you are using a consultancy or an attorney, they may help you with the colas. Um, and if I can quick plug, this is also another service we provide within Sovo Ship Compliant uh, to help you manage your colas, to help that integration with the TDB. Uh, and the quick plug is, is that we, we see a lot more higher uh, first-time approval for, for uh, colas submitted through our service than submitted on your own. Again, this is not a requirement to use our service. Colas Online is great. It's freely available. Um, it's just, you know, you got to do a little bit more, more background checking on your own to uh, ensure that first time approval. Uh, the TTB, once you submit your COLA, the TTB will review it. Uh, they will send it to an individual uh, auditor who will uh, review it. Um, at currently, it takes about, you know, six days, but it can take up to two weeks to review your, your, t your, your label to get the reply from the TTB. Um, again, this is, is really great. Years ago, it used to be months to get a cola, even any kind of information on your cola. So that you can do it in about a week, maybe two weeks is, is just really great. There's been a lot of investment in the TTB to, to ensure that process, uh, is, is easier. So, um, it's, it's been a, a lot easier, but you know, you need to bank on that time. You need to be aware of, of uh, the individual circumstances that might make it a little bit longer uh, so you can get ahead of that. And again, you're not trying to get your, your summer ales out and you're applying for your colas in May because you know, it could uh, get you in trouble then. You want to get ahead of that. Give the TTB time. Um, you should also note that the TTB uh, uh, auditors are individuals. These are just people who are, are hired by the TTB, who are working there. And they can have individual understandings of the rules. Uh, and so this can create some disparities, some what may seem like unfair responses where, uh, you know, one label, one beer label is approved that has some tacit references to marijuana, uh, whereas a similar label goes to a different auditor or maybe, maybe uh, sent back for uh, reapplication uh, because that monitor does not think that... Uh, referencing marijuana is, is they understand the reference to marijuana and don't want it on there. Um, if you are in this situation, again, this is where it can help they be working with counsel. Somebody who does uh, have that relationship with the TTB can kind of explain the 
you know, this got approved last time. I think this should be approved this time too. Uh, um, but, you know, again, it's just sort of recognizing that there is a human factor when it comes to COLA approvals. And some of those edge cases uh, might be a little bit uh, different uh, responses, again, depending on the auditor. Uh, note also the TTB does not reject a COLA application. I guess in the only case they would is if you are trying to apply a, a for a product that is not subject to COLAs, then they would say, you know, just don't come back. Otherwise, in after about a week or two, you'll get a notice from the TTB that says, we do not approve this COLA, at least at this time. We will give you a chance to, re to correct your errors and to submit your COLA application again. You'll then go back to the back of the line and wait that couple of weeks again to get a response. And that can happen a few times depending on uh, what's going on. The TTB should always indicate why they do not accept a uh, COLA. And then again, give you time to correct that. Um, that said, what are the reasons why they they send it back for uh, for uh, why do they return the colas? Why do they send it back for correction? Um, there are frankly a lot of reasons. Again, if you have a big marijuana leaf on there, they're not going to approve that. If you say, uh, you know, improves your your health and makes you live fifty years longer, they're not going to approve that. But but these are really the top three reasons, and really kind of more of the the more uh, uh, um, you know functional reasons, the more uh, uh, systematic reasons, the ones that you can really do a lot to get ahead of and make sure your colas are approved that first time, and so you're avoiding uh, the the time and the effort it takes to go back. A big one is mandatory information error error. Um, and so these are where you've just you know done something a little bit wrong. You you forgot the colon in the government warning. You forgot to you didn't space it quite right. You you didn't size it quite right. You you said um, you know this contains eighteen ounces instead of one point two ounces. All those little errors that you might not think of unless you're really going through your BAM line by line. Um, that's that's a big reason for the TTB to send it back for uh, correction. Uh, so again, make sure you have your, your uh, beverage alcohol manuals on hand. Make sure you're, you're reviewing that beforehand. Uh, make sure you're doing that while you're doing your entire label design process so that you can get ahead of it. Make sure your labels are approved at first time. Another big reason is license discrepancy. Um, so again, I was saying that you need to have your, your uh, uh, licensee name and licensee address, or at least a city and state where it is produced on your label. Uh, but, you know, let's say you move or you were purchased or there was an acquisition, a merger, some sort of thing that changed your license that you are putting on your label, but it doesn't match what is in the TTB's records for your brewer's notice. Um, that creates a discrepancy in the state and the TTB will say uh, something doesn't look right here. This needs to be corrected. And so a big way to get ahead of this is to always report any licenses changes to the TTB right away. If you move, let them know about that move right away. If you were have any kind of merger, if they a ownership change, anything like that, let the TTB know right away so that, again, um, your, your labels can be approved and that all that information matches. Because, uh, again, if the TTB sees something that it doesn't seem right, uh, they're going to send it back. They're going to say, you know, you need to correct this. Uh, something's in interesting here. I don't understand it. Um, this needs to be fixed. Um, another big thing, and we see this a lot with beer especially, is missing formulas. Um, formulas is a whole different subject, easily the subject of another uh, presentation. You know, maybe next time we can talk about formulas. Um, but these are essentially uh, um, notices to the TTB when beer or other products are produced with non-traditional ingredients. Uh, that's when you may need formula approval just to ensure that it is uh, safe and 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 good for human consumption. Um, the TTB has done a lot to uh, expand what are traditional ingredients. Uh, so a few years ago, they sent out another long list of, of different fruits and juices and extracts that can be included in beer that would not require a formula. But you know, if if you have a label and it seems to not, if it seems to include ingredients that are quote unquote non traditional. The, uh, the, the auditor will say, you know, I don't have a formula on hand. This doesn't seem right. So if you have that label, it says, you know, produced with gold leaf and no formula on hand. That's another reason that they're, they're going to say your cola is not approved. Um, so, again, just get ahead of your formulas. Uh, check out the formulas formulation uh, page with the TTB's website 
and understand when you might be crossing those lines and you may need a formula. Uh, you may need that, that initial approval from the TTB to sell your, your beer because again, you know, that's, especially when it comes to, if you have a missing formula that can add as many weeks to uh, the entire process. Um, and again, if you are in a tight schedule to get your beer out, that's going to be problematic uh, because this is all required in order to get your product into commerce. Um, the last thing I'll talk about with colas is allowable revisions. Uh, these are when you want to change your label. You know, that happens all the time. We have a new overall uh, image. We have new information. We're going to sell this in a different container ties. Um, your labels may change. And you that may require you to get a new cola. Note that there is no way to take an existing cola and just revise it, say, oh, it looks different. Basically, if you do change your, your label, you need to get a new cola. Uh, you should inform the TTB that your old labels are no longer in sale. Please cancel those old colas. And then you get a new one starting with that process all over again. This can be, again, timely and problematic. So what the TTB has done over the last few years is add a lot of called allowable revisions. So these are changes you can make to your label that don't require you to get a new cola and can save you a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, there is a long list of these allowable revisions. They're different for the different product types, beer, wine, spirits. Um, so I, I highly recommend going to this website, uh, ttb.gov slash labeling slash allowable revisions. Uh, that is a, a long, they will provide a long list of what is allowed. They will provide some examples of what it looks like. And they could actually have a tool if you can say, this is a change I'm making. Does this require a new cola or not? So very helpful. Um, broadly, the types of allowable revisions are sort of um, not when, when it deals with non-mandatory information or, or standard information, that's when you can make a change that does not require a new review. So if you just have a, a statement on, you know, tastes great, something like that, and you no longer want it on your label, non-mandatory information, you can delete that without worry. If you're repositioning all, uh, some already approved labels or, or images or text, that's fine. Um, I, and there are certain uh, changes you can make to mandatory information, such as the net contents or alcoholic statement, as long as your changes are still consistent and still abide by the uh, formatting requirements as set out uh, in the BAMs. So if you now want to, you know, you have a, a 12 ounce bottle and you want to now sell the same exact beer, same exact label, just scaled up to a 16 ounce bottle, that's fine. Just make sure that your net contents uh, is accurate to the new bottle and follows the proper format. Uh, but you know, you can just do that without needing a new cola and easy to get it in commerce right away. Um, so again, a lot of information there, a lot of different stuff about what it is and isn't required uh, from the federal regulations. Again, I, I highly recommend just looking through the TTB's website. Um, they, they really do want to make sure everybody is compliant. They want to make sure you're successful. Uh, and they do provide a lot of, of, of good information. So I, I highly recommend checking them out, having that BAM on hand when you're designing labels, really getting ahead of this. Uh, but, you know, we're running a little bit short on time. So I want to make sure we get on to the next part, uh, state registration, state regulations of beer labels, because it's, it's fine to have your federal rules in place, but now you are trying to sell them in interstate commerce. You know, you're, you're, you're entering a new state. What do you need to know? Um, when it comes to state rules for labels, honestly, there are not a whole lot of different rules about what it is and is not allowed on, on labels, what is required, what is prohibited. Most states follow the federal rules, and they actually explicitly state that in their laws. They'll say, um, you know, they would set out a beer label must follow federal rules. They, they would cite the federal statutes. Uh, but this is, again, why it's very handy to have a COLA, because you can indicate, well, I am following uh, federal rules. This is compliant. This is good. And therefore, this is allowed in, in pretty much every state's. Um, note again that because the uh, even if you're not selling in interstate commerce, even if you are selling your products only in the state where you're producing them, uh, they still must meet the requirements of the Internal Revenue Code. So your government warning, your uh, brand name, your net contents all has to be on there in the right proper formats. Um, note this does only apply to stuff you are selling in commerce. So bottling or canning, if you are just um, you know, you know, selling out of your tap room, 
then the, most of these rules would not apply. But again, as soon as it gets into that container, that's when you need to follow those rules. Uh, and again, then it's, it's important to recognize the different rules in the different states. There are not a whole lot of variations, but they do exist. Uh, the one I always like to cite is how Mississippi prohibits any information on alcoholic contents, whereas Washington requires you to indicate the, 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 your ABV. Um, note again that the ABV is not a requirement for the federal rules. So this is where the states are adding or subtracting other, other requirements depending on what their own particular uh, uh, regulatory policy is. Uh, when it comes to state regulations, really the most important one to follow is the registration of your labels. That's really the most requ the biggest requirement. Otherwise, they say, you know, as long as you follow the federal rules, uh, it's your label should be good. But make sure that they're registered. Make sure that we have an indication of what you are selling. Uh, and, you know, why do they require this reg registration? Most often it is to identify what's on the store shelves. Uh, state regulators are frequently going into license into liquor stores, into grocery stores, and they're scanning down the line. They're saying, do we have a record of these products? Do we know who is selling these products? Do we know where these products are coming from? Do we know who is distributing them? And behind that is, are we getting taxes from those, those uh, uh, beer on these shelves as well? And so many states, <clears throat> excuse me, most states do require all suppliers, in-state, out-of-state suppliers, to have gone through the state registration process, this brand label registration process, and have identified what will be sold in, in commerce in that state. Um, the other rules are other reasons are kind of to create, uh, to make sure that your labels are proper, that they have all the required prohibited information, that they are, are abiding by the federal rules, that they're abiding by the different rules in the different states. And, and I'm going to talk a lot, a little bit more about this later. Uh, again, this is a, a huge complex issue, but a lot of these registrations relate to the franchise rules and distributor, distributor infra, uh, regulations in the various states. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and so again, when you're doing uh, uh, label registrations, maybe the state does not necessarily care about, oh, do you have your, your net contents in the proper format? They want to know who is responsible for your beer in the state and where it's being sold and is that all properly set up. Um, so again, a lot of these registrations then deal with franchise rules, deal with distributor information, creating that kind of record uh, so that the states can, again, monitor, understand who's responsible for what, and make sure they're getting their taxes. Uh, here's a map, a breakdown of what states do require brand label registration. Um, and, and so you can see it's not every state. There are plenty of them where, you know, basically once you get your license, once you get your distributor in order, you can go ahead and sell pretty much all your beers. And, and when you get a new one online, uh, you can just go ahead and, and say, you know, Arizona distributor, we're going to send you our golden ale in the fall now and without needing to go and get approval from the state first. But most states do have some kind of label registration. Uh, you can see these colors are broken down by what product types are required. Uh, so the light blue states, that's where beer, wine, spirits, aquavit, uh, limoncello, brapa, whatever you're selling, needs to be registered with the state before it gets sold in commerce. Uh, again, there might be different certain there might be different uh, uh, requirements. There might be different processes for the different product types. But whatever will whatever you're selling will need to be uh, registered with the state first. Uh, then there are the, the red outlined states uh, where only wine and beer need to be registered. Uh, an acute observer might note that those are all uh, control states. Uh, so those are all states where uh, the, the sale and distribution of spirits is monitored and managed by the state itself. That's why spirits are excluded. All of the products being sold in the private market, though, would need to be registered, listed with the state at some uh, uh, to some extent. And then there are the handful of dark blue states where uh, beer only needs to be registered. Uh, again, mostly control states, except for California. Um, so, so again, if you are selling in any of these states, uh, basically because you're, you're selling beer or malt beverages you would almost certainly need to be uh, uh, registering your labels in all of these states. Only the gray ones would be exceptions. Uh, there is a couple of notes here on this slide. So for instance, California, the label registrations, it's, it's not really label registrations. However, California has a very extensive and very complicated, very 
uh, eye crossing product price posting system. Uh, and there that kind of includes label registration. So you would need to at least indicate what labels, what brands you're selling in the state and then get your price posting in order with that. Uh, similarly, Nevada doesn't really have label approvals. It's instead when you, you need to appoint your distributor, you need to send in a, a uh, notice of a distributor appointment to the state. And then you would include a list of what labels, what brands would be included in that authorization. Um, note, Hawaii is grayed out. That's not a state that requires registrations. Um, Hawaii is a weird one in that they have uh, each county in Hawaii operates its own beverage alcohol uh, um, uh, agency. Uh, so Oahu, Hawaii, uh, Honolulu, uh, and map, excuse me, Oahu, Oahu and Honolulu are the same place. So I'll get start over again. The Big Island, Hawaii, Oahu, Kauai, and Maui each have different agencies, different rules, different systems. Honolulu specifically does not require label registrations, but they do appreciate being sent an email when you're going to sell a different brand there. Again, not a requirement, but it's sort of being friendly to the agency there. Uh, and note then, Utah is, this only applies for low ABV beer. I believe it's 5% uh, ABV. That's because the state is a control state for any higher alcoholic content beer. So uh, if you're selling low ABV beer, you need to let them know. If you're selling higher ABV beer in Utah, you actually need to go through the control board. And that's a whole different system there as well. So um, again, just have, uh, be aware of these states. Be aware when you're distributing into a new place what these label registrations may be, that they exist, and that there are different processes. What do these processes look like? Again, they vary they vary widely by different states. Uh, I'd say broadly, the things to be aware of is first, get things in order, understand what states you're selling into, make sure you are authorized to sell into that state. Uh, many states have licenses required for out-of-state suppliers. Um, understand what beers you'll be selling there. Um, you know, it, it's interstate distribution can be complicated, can be costly, and you really want to be uh, not get ahead of yourself. Um, you know, you may only be selling a couple flagship uh, uh, products as opposed to your entire catalog of, of offerings uh, when you're selling interstate. So, again, recognize what you'll be selling. Make sure you got that market. Make sure you can, can uh, sell it there. Get that in order. The next thing is to have your distributors in order. Uh, again, very complicated, uh, very fraught. There's a lot that can go into getting your distributors in order. Uh, make sure you have a good one. Make sure you have a good distributor agreement work with counsel. It's definitely worth hiring a lawyer just to do a, a contract review on your distributor agreements. Don't do handshake agreements. Don't just sign whatever your distributor sends over. Review that. Make sure it's in order because you can get caught with your uh, in a bad situation if you have a bad distributor agreement. Uh, but you need to have it in order before your brand label registrations. Uh, because many states, again, require you to provide that information. They may require you even to provide a copy of your contract. So get all that information in order. Get your paperwork in order. Uh, make sure you're using the right form and getting your COLA, your distributor agreement, territory maps, whatever the state may require on hand. Because otherwise, you'll be uh, going back and spending a lot more time getting that, that in order. Then when it's all in order, you go to the proper system, either it's a paper file or a lot of states are going to online filings. Um, get, you know, make sure you're going to the right system. Uh, calculate the cost. Uh, a lot of states do charge for label registrations. Um, many are moving more towards free, so it can be you know, free or a, a token cost to do a label registration. Other states, it can cost hundreds of dollars per label to do a registration. And so, you know, if you're selling into, say, Connecticut, you know, maybe it makes sense to only do one or two beers and not all 20 because that can be very costly to do that. Um, and again, you want to get ahead of that. Make sure you understand if the fee is per brand, that's sort of more broader overall category of products, or if it is per label, each, each individual different product you're selling. Uh, because again, that can be uh, lead to very cheap or very costly uh, registration processes. And then once you've done all that, you really want to make sure your registration has been verified. Uh, you, most states will send you a notice. They'll say, you know, we got record of this. You're good. Some states will take a time to review. Georgia, for example, will take several weeks to review your labels. They do a lot. 
Other states will do it instantly. You know, as soon as you click the submit button uh, and get that confirmation email, you would be good to sell that product in the state. You can go turn around and start selling it. But you really don't want to be selling a product until you have that verification. Uh, otherwise, you can get in trouble with that with the state. So, so get ahead of that. Make sure you're 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 not missing anything. Um, very quickly, some other state registration concerns. Again, if you are only selling products in your home state, uh, there may you may not have a cola, but there may still be a registration process that could be different. From Most products are so are, are registered under product registration online, the pro service. But if you are a Colorado brewer selling in Colorado, you instead have to go to the the uh, liquor enforcement division's website and find a little uh, link that says in-state producer and register there. Uh, revisions, similarly, uh, you may need to register those with the state whenever you make any changes. A lot of states will usually say only register a revision when you need the new COLA, but many states will say, uh, some states will say, no, any change, we need a new revision. And often those can be a different process. You can take an existing registration and say, here's a change with this one. You don't necessarily need to do a new, whole new registration. Uh, and that can save you some time and money as well if there is a revision process. Uh, note that a lot of states require uh, labels to be renewed, that registration to be renewed every year, every few years. Again, this can be very costly. This can be a time to review and say, you know, we're just not selling this product in the state. We don't want to do this again. Uh, but, you know, unlike colas, colas last forever. Many state registrations do expire. You will need to renew that. So be aware of that. Um, and, and lastly, there are these line extensions. This is not quite as common a thing, but this is a, related to brand registrations. So when you have an overarching brand, you know, that, that coral beer, and then I have a, a brown ale, a golden ale, a pilsner. If there's a state that allows line extensions, that can be an easier way to just sort of slip in new, new labels, new individual products without having to go with a whole new uh, uh, registration process. Not as common as it used to be, but again, where they're available, can save you some time and money. Very, very briefly, I just want to quick again highlight the, 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 the fraught situation when it comes to franchise rules and distributor agreements. Again, frankly, there could be an entire conference just on these. These get very complicated. Uh, there's a lot that goes into these. Uh, the overall message when it comes to understanding franchise rules and getting your distributor agreements in order is talk to a lawyer. Uh, talk to somebody who knows alcohol rules Talk to somebody who knows the specific rules of the state where you are shipping into because they are all different. Uh, broadly, these rules restrict how you can interact with distributors. They restrict, may restrict the number of distributors you can work with. You know, only one distributor per state, only one distributor per territory, only one distributor per brand. Again, they vary widely state by state. A lot of these rules, when it comes to franchise rules, restrict your ability to cancel or renegotiate your agreements. Uh, you may need to show good cause. You may need to show good cause specifically as defined by statute. You can't just say, you know, they're pouring my, my beer in the garbage. You have to actually, you know, that has to be a good cause under the state statutes. Uh, you often need to give time to correct, you know, six months a year. And if you have a bad distributor, that's six months a year where they're going to continue to be a bad distributor and you can't do anything about it. So this is really why you need to get ahead of your distributor agreements make sure they're in order, make sure you uh, understand each other's obligations. You can set out these conditions of good cause. You can set out what might be reason to cancel or negotiate. Uh, and why I'm talking about them in relation to uh, brand label registrations is again, many, many states require you to submit uh, distributor agreements, territory maps during your, your label registrations because they monitor, they police, they regulate these franchise rules very closely. Uh, and, and so they need a record of that. And so these getting these in order before you even get into brand label registrations is, is very key, very central. Uh, and again, just that, that, you know, get advice, talk to somebody who's experienced. Don't just sign whatever a distributor sends over. Don't operate under a handshake agreement. Even if it's somebody you know for 20 years, you know, just have it down in writing so you know what your obligations are. Uh, you know, you, you, these agreements, the contracts generally really only matter when something's going wrong. And so this is why you don't want to rely on good feelings. You want to know what your obligations are to begin with. Um, and again, you know, really fraught, but th there's a lot to this information. There's a lot to labeling. Uh, it's, it's, you know, labels are so important in order to sell and market your product. 
but you really want to get ahead of these rules because if a state, if the federal government finds out you're doing something wrong, that's reason for them to come down, issue fines, issue notices, remove licensing. Um, otherwise, it's just a matter of getting ahead of this and making sure that you are, are uh, um, you know, not wasting time. You're, you're getting your colas before you're even really ready to sell. Just getting it all in order so you can avoid problems and, and getting ahead of things. Um, because, you know, this is, is a, a, a overlooked but very important part of this industry. And, and we don't want you to get in trouble. We want you to be successful. Um, that said, I think I got maybe a couple more minutes. If there are any questions coming in, happy to help. Again, I would say if you have more, more in, if you want to know how we can help you, if you want to have more information about interstate distributions and brand labeling information, we do have a lot of free information publicly available on our website, solos.com slash ship compliant. Um, other than that, you know, again, I just want to thank everybody again for joining me, for listening to me ramble for an hour on, on all these complex, uh, very legalese uh, topics. And again, just a huge thank you to the CBB for inviting me back. Uh, I, I hope to be back again in, in future conferences, talk to you about these uh, complex, but really interesting, really important issues. Um, and other than that, I guess, you know, I'll just wish you all a good day and a lot of success in your distributions, in your manufacturing, uh, and, and hoping to see your labels on shelves near me soon. Um, so for that, thank you again. And, and thank you. Um, hope to see you soon.